Thanks very much for coming. Um, my name is Anya Doyle and I am a conservation consultant and I've been engaged to look at the um, uh, the church, St. Mary's Church West Porch, I suppose from the perspective of its architectural significance and its cultural significance, architectural heritage significance. And just I want to acknowledge as well, I didn't have a logo to put into the Heritage Council, and I did, but it was uh, the formatting didn't work for my computer. So anyhow, the Heritage Council are very generously uh, part of the, um, the, the compilation of a, um, a management plan for the church, uh, given the uh, the works that are required to be undertaken in the next couple of years. And um, as part of that, this Heritage Week, they, the Heritage Council asked that anybody that, that, that is, is doing the work that's funded by them will undertake an event to publicise, I suppose, the work that's being done, because it's not just a, a report that ends up on a shelf of gathering dust. So uh, you're all very welcome here and to hear the, um, the contents of that, with the, the background to that. So um, St Mary's Church Westport then, uh, just to, to give you an idea of the structure of the talk, it should last possibly 45 to 50 minutes, so it might be a few minutes at the end if anybody wants to ask questions. And the, uh, the general structure is we we'll look at the historical context and the architectural design first, and um, then we look at the interior and its decoration, and then the special section on stained glass, because it's so special in this church. And finally, then we look at the works that are um, being undertaken, or at least that are being devised plans for, for works um, for the conservation of the church. So, um, just a few photographs to remind you of what we're dealing with. So. The, the Church of St. Mary um, is the result of three phases of development. Uh, there was a church there in existence at the early 19th century in 1813. Um, and the most um, obvious, I suppose, and tangible evidence of this is the date stone here um, uh, in the external wall. Um, it was a very small church uh, built in the Georgian Gothic style, 16 years before Catholic emancipation, so it's quite uh, sort of significant for that reason. Um, at least it's been secured for a Catholic chapel and parochial house as early as 1787, but construction was delayed, possibly due to lack of funds at that time. So a father, Oliver Kelly, was responsible for generating funds and for overseeing the construction of this church. So the, uh, that's it there. Um, as you can see, it was quite a handsome building and we would consider that certainly today and if it was to be considered for demolition i'm sure it would be an absolute no no um, under, the, under the present um, uh, because i suppose we've moved moved on in a different direction uh, this was demolished in the 19 late 1950s for the new front of the church that you see there today and um the so a description of the that's another view from the other angle down the mall just giving you an idea of uh, how well it's sat into its context i suppose that's one thing and um, the railings were continuous across the front of it and um the the, the scale of it i suppose was, was really appropriate for the, the terrace of, of sort of her uh, georgian vernacular classical uh, houses the um the interior of the church, uh, I have lucky to have a photograph of it actually, and it was, um, it was orientated correctly um, with its altar at the east end. So that's the, the view of that is as if you had come in the door would be on your left there. So you come in and that, that altar was on your left when you come into the church. Um, so uh, with a clear picture of the layout from a survey of the existing church, uh, floor plan. I'll go back to that in a second. And you know what? I'm not leaving out the floor plan. That's what desperate. Sorry. I'll go through. This is a. If you look at the left hand side of this floor plan, that gives you an idea that where, where it's not hatched in solid. It's the, that, that's the original plan of the original church. So it was just that deep. Um, and the entrance is there on the left hand side. And um, there was a access, which is now still there, the access on the, the left of the window facing the church um, to a vestry behind the, behind the altar. So just go back to this wonderful um, 
piece of just an inscription outside the church. So this is another piece of sort of tangible um, solid evidence of the original church. And the inscription on the, on the dedication stone once famously read, this is an awful place, the house of God uh, from Genesis. Uh, this biblical text, then, the meaning, obviously, of awful here is something that inspires awe. Uh, the words, however, were later felt to cause offence and were removed, so the plaque now reads, this is the house of God. <laughs> so, um, erected by subscription and strenuous exertion of most reverend Oliver Kelly, um, aided by the parishioners. There's a description, a full description of the strenuous exertion um, that was made by Reverend Oliver Kelly in, an, in a subscription booklet which was published by the church in 1927 uh, to request donations from the public for an extension that was to be built in the 1920s, which I'll talk more about in a minute. And it describes the difficulties which must have been encountered in funding the church when Catholics were, were subdued by penal laws. Um, it was erected in one of the, I suppose, one of the quotes from that, uh, from Oliver Kelly's description, is that it was erected in such dire circumstances. The building was, of course, not perfect, um, and it, after 114 years, it became totally inadequate. And that was, they were the reasons for its its demolition in the um, in the 50s. The 1813 church then. Uh, move on to the, the next phase of development. This is an 1838 map of the town. So you can see that the church occupies a very small space uh, on the map. And um, today the church stretches back to here. So you can see that the massive scale of um, the church as we have it today. This is because of the, map, the work that was done in the uh, the 1920s, 1928-32 extension. So, in the 1920s, the church authorities decided to make alterations to enlarge and extend the existing 1813 building, which was a big undertaking. The design was to be on a large scale, um, and a statement of the strength of the Catholic Church in the newly independent Ireland of the 1920s. So, we're talking here about 1928. Um, Ireland had literally just received its, uh, achieved its independence in 22, so it's very soon after that. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at um, also gearing up to the very important date of 1932 for the Catholic Church in Ireland, which was going to be the Eucharistic Congress, and it was also going to be the uh, commemoration of the 1500th anniversary of the arrival of St. Patrick in Ireland. So really they were thinking ahead, so they were giving themselves time uh, to have the church ready and open and ready to be consecrated by 1932. Um, the, the architect commissioned to design the new extension was the then highly regarded <coughs> Rudolf Maximilian Butler, um, born in 1872 and died in 1943. Um, he was professor of architecture at University College Dublin from 1924 uh, until he died and he was of Irish and German parentage. Um, he spent his youth in Germany, but returned to Dublin uh, to work with, in the office of Walter Doon, an architect, um, and he eventually became partner there in 1899. He was a Moravian by upbringing, interestingly, but uh, his connections with Doon and chance introduction to the passion of fathers and marriage gave him an entree into Catholic ecclesiastical circles, and he became a leading architect of Catholic churches, particularly in Ulster and Connacht. He married a male woman, actually, and Annie Gibbons uh, in 1911. Um, his first major architectural success came in 1912 when he won the prize, first prize in competition for designing UCDs. That's how many of us might know his work best is UCD, Arts for Terrace, and now the National Concert Hall. Um, some of his other works in Mayo include St. Patrick's Church in Newport, um, and he also carried out alterations and improvements to the Church of St. Mary in Ballinrobe. Um, the style chosen for the new church then was, these are some images of drawings by Oren Butler for the, the new extension. Just to give you an idea, there's a section through, and you can see the old 1813 church, tiny in scale, which would, that was the scale that suited the, the setting of the mall, and the massive um, scale of the new extension behind. So that was the, um, gives you an idea. Again, you can see in the, in the roof plan, you can see the, the roof of the, 
the church, uh, the 1813 church on the left there, with the, the, uh, the ridge running parallel to the mall and perpendicular to the new church. So I won't go on to the bell tower yet. Um, the, so the style chosen for, for the new church was, was Romanesque. Um, the style was and the scale really recalled the grandeur. If we go back to that, that section, it uh, gives you an idea of that style and scale. Because you're, you're all very familiar with it from, from being in the church. But it was, it, was, um, it was to recall the grandeur and power of ancient Rome and was also highly appropriate to the Roman Catholic Church as a reminder of the centre of the faith in Rome in Vatican City. The style and design were intended to inspire awe and wonder with rows of imposing columns flanking the nave and supporting a high barrel vaulted ceiling, uh, leading to a monumental domed crossing. The eye was led to the sanctuary beyond the crossing by an ornate marble pal- baldachino. We'll see some lovely pictures of that in a few moments. Um, and above and beyond the baldachino then was uh, the curved wall of the apse. Um, it was not punct- that the apse wasn't punctuated by windows at all, so you have a very, uh, in a sense, enclosed space at the back of the church. Light flooded in to the church through the as yet undecorated and therefore plain glazed round-headed windows along the sides, which are now all stained glass. They were plain glazed at the time, and it was only over the years that the church was given uh, the stained glass. Was, uh, uh, it was dedicated, and all of these windows were being paid for by, by local families and in memory of uh, lost uh, loved ones. So, an interesting aspect of the 1928 uh, church was the bell tower, which was never built. But these are some beautiful drawings held in the d- diocesan archives in June of what the tower would have looked like in Westport. It would have completely dominated the town. Mm-hmm. Um, because the scale of the church itself, I pointed out a minute ago in relation to the old church, was really, which is really the context of the mile, and then you have this even higher up again. Um, some beautiful drawings and the, um, a section through as well, just showing um, the, the height, the number of stories involved in the, in the tower. So, um, uh, there's a series of letters as well. I mean, this is such an interesting story to come across for me as somebody researching the history of the building. Not only the beautiful images, but we've actually got a full story in a series of letters um, from uh, Butler himself, from the architect, to the local administration uh, church uh, of the church, Father Daly. And uh, he, Oren Butler, wrote to Father Daly in closing the drawings for the tower. So this was 1938, we're talking 10 years now, the church is already built at this stage, and uh, the church is consecrated in 1932. And in 1938, they're, they're considering, still considering the, the uh, building of this tower. And um, he described the proposal in detail, I'll read it to you. Um, he said, it would rise to a total height of over 160 feet above the ground, which is quite a lofty tower and necessary for a church this size. The bell chamber is 14 feet square inside and will accommodate the existing time of eight bells, with room for such additional bells as are likely to be fixed. The construction will be of reinforced concrete, which is the only economic proposition in Ireland in recent times, and it will be finished externally to harmonise with the church. Concrete floors will be fixed at suitable intervals with the wooden stairs connecting them for access to the bell chamber. And the roof of the tower would be of copper or special tiles, and the copper would be gilded, which would have a very fine effect for the metal gilded roof, and would be surmounted by a copper gilded cross. And the tower should dominate the neighbourhood. So it's even written in the letter. <laughs> that was the intention. Um, from the contents then of a letter the following January, um, it appears the plans for the tower didn't meet with the approval of the, um, the local uh, clergy and particularly the proposal to, to roof it with copper. Um, and then in this letter, Butler mentions that there may be an alternative option of actually building the tower as part of the completion of the church. <coughs> so already they're thinking ahead to the 1950s front extension. The, they're talking about the completion of the church in 1938. They're thinking they're actually going to uh, demolish the, the front building um, at that stage. So it was, you know, phased, but, but obviously they were, they, 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 they were contemplating on having a full Romanesque church at that stage and that, that the tower would go at the front. Um, but then there were possible risks attached to the idea of having the tower on the mall 
um, so near the river, and but they're anticipated that it might present certain difficulties of cost and construction there. So it appears then that um, there was there was little appetite at the time, and um, the, some interesting comments came through from uh, the, the clergy. Um, the responses were generally negative. Um, in uh, the 14th of March, this would have been uh, 1938. Dennis Ryder, a parish priest, said, I do not like the design of the tower. It looks like to be a skyscraper. Our pillared standard support cross would be for the most part hidden from view and would not in any way, I think, add to the external beauty of the church or conform to the symmetry of the great dome. Um, I do not see the necessity or use of perching the time of bells on the top of such pillars. So, uh, the, so the tower was never constructed um, and it's hard not to think how it might have looked um, in a compound town like Westport. So um, that's what we have instead today, is the, um, uh, the a bit different, <laughs> exactly, but certainly not as imposing uh, as the, the other. In 1927, then, it's a really interesting subscription booklet was published to encourage donations for the church. And it was sort of almost like a commemorative booklet as well for the, um, the anniversary of, of the arrival of St. Patrick. And also for the Eucharistic Congress, um, very a lovely little publication, and it contains um, really just, a, 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 in a way, it's a celebration of the um, the long-standing uh, tradition of pilgrimage to, to Crow Patrick. Uh, this is of great interest, and it shows a really nice section through <coughs> the church as it was when the 1928, well, this was published 27, so this is as it was to be when it was complete, uh, when the extension was complete with the tower. So, um, and it shows the interior there, which is, well, that was a sketch design at the time, and obviously the Baldacchino is quite different now, mm -hmm. and there are a few differences to the, uh, the current church. So, the 1957 extension, as you can see, is simply, this is an early version, so there aren't, it, it's not exactly as it is now, but it just gives you an idea of what it looks like in the cross section <coughs> through the church. Um, just to give you a background to, to this phase of development, um, the front extension was designed by a man named James Rupert Edward Boyd Barrett, a <laughs> long winded name. Uh, 1904 to 1976. His core architect, who had been a pupil in the offices of Jones and Kelly, was educated at Dublin School of Art and University College London. And during nearly half a century in practice, he designed many major buildings throughout the country, including the Department of Industry and Commerce, and this is in Kildare Street in Dublin, uh, four new churches in Cork, and ten new churches in Kerry. Um, so he was, he was a church builder. <coughs> the boy Barrett designed went through several iterations and it too included a tower. So have a look, there's the tower that uh, Boyd Barrett was suggesting and proposing for the mall elevation. So again, it would have looked quite different to mm -hmm. um, The design um, at that stage as well, it finished in a, a, a gable with three lancets um, instead of the rose window that we have now. And these in a sense, I think fit well into the overall design and there's a coherence there with the the reoccurrence of the, the tripartite windows on the top of the tower and in the um, the base either side of the um, the doors. Uh, however, these uh, were replaced then with this is almost as it was built. Mm -hmm. have it as, there it is as it, as, as it was actually built in the end. Um, and the so this large area, I suppose, of blank walls, quite a sort of monolithic facade. Um, but the, the statue of Our Lady then in the centre really sort of softens that softens that and, and uh, makes it less masculine, I suppose, in, in appearance. Um, sorry about that, that's on the side. I was just showing you that to see, to show you Omega Tower and the words there. So obviously, it went quite far in terms of, of design stage. Uh, process and it was at a late stage they decided uh, probably again due to funds uh, um, I mean there's so many churches across the world that haven't got a tower because 
there as money and the stuff that she wasn't wasn't be. So interior then. The the scaliola columns, I suppose, are one of the um, the highlights of the interior of the church. Um, there's a wonderful drawing I'll show you now here. This is in the Irish Architectural Archive. It's a beautiful watercolour drawing done in 1930s. This was actually done before the church was finished. The extension of the church was completed. And the name of the artist is Cyril A. Farry. He produced um, this for, especially for an exhibition at the Royal Academy in 1930. Um, he was one of the best known and most sought after architectural draftsmen in England in the 1920s and 30s and worked for some of the most successful architects of his day, including Oren Butler, <coughs> the architect of this church. And he used to charge a shilling per square inch for his colour perspectives, <laughs> so, <laughs> and was reputed to have earned the enormous sum of £5,000 per annum at the height of his career. <coughs> the beautiful imp and impressive drawing shows the grandeur of the space before it was furnished with pews. And uh, the floor pattern and the app stone decoration shown here weren't executed, but the pulpit, the baldachino, and the crucifix are accurate representations <coughs> of the finished interior. <coughs> so the spirit of the place really hasn't changed since that time, and it's very pretty much as it was intended. The scagliola columns, then, um, one of the striking um, elements of the interior are these columns and they dominate it and they give the space a sense of soaring height as well as warmth and colour. Um, they're not marble but were intended to look like marble. Uh, and because of, the scagliola is a much cheaper material <coughs> and although cheaper <coughs> marble, the material is nonetheless painstaking to make, make and it's a skilled art in its own right. Um, I, I suppose years ago when I um, originally um, my background is in architectural history and you'd be reading about these techniques and you really have no idea until you see how they're actually done, how much effort goes into them. And now we have YouTube, which is fantastic, so it's able to go on to YouTube and have a look at people making scagliola and it's really an involved um, process of mixing uh, it's stucco, so it's basically plaster mixed with pigments. And they knead it like dough, so they, they put in the pigments in you know clumps, and they knead this, the, the plaster like dough, and then they flatten it out, and they uh, they apply it to the wall directly, and then they they scrape um, off the surface, and then they polish it twice, and um, so it's an incredibly involved process. But and they're artists, obviously, they they just make this stuff look like marble. You know, it's mm -hmm. amazing how they manage to do that, but. So, uh, so even though it is, it's, it's a cheaper version, it's an incredible material in its own right. Um, the word comes from the Italian scaglia, which means chips or scales, and it was, it was a very fashionable technique in 17th century Italy. And it was, it was popular throughout Europe, really, uh, up into the 19th, late 19th and early 20th century. Um, so one of the Boyd Barrett drawings from the 1950s shows the specification for Scagliola, uh, which is supposed to represent Red Verona, according to that drawing. Uh, these are, this actually just shows you a couple of indications that the church isn't, wasn't all built at the same time, that these three, the bases to these three columns are a different material to the rest of them. So you've got your grey vein marble there for, from the 1930s church. And these are from the, the 1950s front extension. There's just a few, once you start looking, you see, you see the clues. And they're hollow. And they're hollow columns as well. <laughs> we still have to really figure out what they're made of. So the drawing, unfortunately, is on its ear there. Sorry, like, put it up so you can actually see it correctly. Uh, so you can see that it is for um, the drawing. Is, the writing is very, very tiny there. But basically, it's to be two, to be two inch scagliola on a twenty five inch concrete um, column. And uh, so it's very and specifically designed to look like a very specific type of um, of um, of of marble, red Verona. So from a specific location. Um, there are seven columns, including engaged columns, on either side of the church, and three of these at the back, as I've said already, are uh, slightly different. Um, 
they don't appear to say that they're, they're hollow. Um, and it were, it's unlikely that Scagliola, I think anyhow, we still have to agree on this one, but it's unlikely that Scagliola was used um, for, for those later columns. Uh, but we still have to, to, to work out exactly what they're, they're made of. Um, the Baldacchino then is absolutely stunning, amazing piece of work. It's like a building inside a building, really. And um, it shelters there under beautiful blue um, sort of, uh, semi dome of the, of the apse with the uh, decorated stars. The apse walls are covered in vertical strips from floor to springing point of the half dome. And these vertical strips, again, uh, are possibly Scagliola um, or marble. Um, and separated by boards, borders of gilded mosaic tiles. So it's highly decorative at, at this instant. All of the focus is on the Eucharist, so it's all on the... And, and formerly the altar, actually. There's a photograph of the church from the 1930s, which I thought I had here. I think I might have it coming up. No, I didn't include it, sorry. But it just shows that the, the priest has his back to the congregation. Mm -hmm. It was before the um, before Vatican II, so so Vatican II was, you know, performed more a function, if you like, in its original capacity. Um, it's an impressive uh, form in itself, mm -hmm. and the angels which stand rigidly upright at the base of the dome uh, with their gilded table is very 1930s in style. They almost look like something you'd see on the facade of a, of a cinema, mm -hmm. um, but they're certainly. Um, it's, it's of its time, even though it, not in, a, in, in an outward way, but it's there, you can sense it. Um, this is a wonderful little drawing again from the two archives. And although it wasn't executed, or well, certainly not in the church now, but possibly executed and then possibly taken to another location, who knows whether it was ever made, but it's a tabernacle by um, an architect. This is an architect designed. A uh, piece of um, uh, you know equipment, if you like, ecclesiastical uh, furniture. Although the design wasn't executed, uh, it's just a really wonderful example of the attention to detail that's that was paid to the design of um, of these objects. Um, it's from W. H. Burns on Architects and dates to 1944, and you can see in the plan really detailed specifications for how this to work, including sliding doors and tracks. For the doors to slide on, and um, you know, gilded um, steel. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of information in, in there. So the stations of the cross then are by um, Hubert McGoldrick. These these belong to the, the extension from the 30s. These are 1931 date, and he won a, Hubert McGoldrick um, won an award for. Um, for these, it was as part he, he they were commissioned as part of a competition um, for the Ainak Talton, which are like a, um, a set of like Olympic Games, mm -hmm. if you like, from but I don't know if anybody is familiar with these um, that existed as, as a way of, I suppose, uh, reinforcing the, the new Ireland, you know, that um, they were really they were there as a, as, a, as a marker of independence and. and you know, showing the capacity that the country had for, for in all areas, in sport, but also design. Design is included in, in these, these competitions, these games. Um, so it's a really special collection of what's known as opus sectile work, and literally it just means it's a, it's a kind of mosaic. Um, and the you know, difference, I suppose, between true mosaic and opus sectile is that the, the pieces um, are uh, much larger. They're almost like stained glass. There's a lot of comparison in between this technique and stained glass. Uh, and he was a stained glass artist. He worked with the with Antour Glinna, who with the Goldrick did. Um, he trained in the Metropolitan School of Art and received his training in stained glass painting uh, from early in company, which he joined in 1913 and he moved to Glinna then in uh, 1920. So the other beautiful, I suppose, aspect of these is the old Irish script, and this would have, again have been um, a, a reflection of New Ireland and uh, really the confidence that uh, so 
major stained glass firm uh, providing stained glass for, and still does actually, they're still in existence today. Um, I think they, they started up either the, the 1860s, certainly the, the um, middle, early to middle 19th century, and they, um, uh, they produce stained glass for all over the world. Uh, and this is around, I suppose, the church, this, these are unusual in this church because they're the only foreign stained glass in um, St. Mary's. The rest of it is all Irish. So it, it's really a, an anomaly in a way that, that, that these are, are here. Um, but, and we think they date to 1915, although they're dated 1880 in another source. So it's, it's not absolutely conclusive when they were, when they were made. And because Franz Meyer of Munich op have operated for the last you know, uh, however many years, but it's possible to tell, um, really. So they are um, absolutely beautiful. They're, the Franz Meyer of Munich were, were noted for their um, sensitivity in, in, in depicting faces. So you can really see in this um, their approach. Uh, Uh, William Murray then is a, um, these two are by William Murray, and they, these are absolutely beautiful, you can see, so most of the stained glass at the moment, as you're probably aware, is covered up, these ones are still visible, and I haven't been able to see the others in reality, so I think maybe I'm biased, but uh, the ones I haven't been able to see, I'm not that enthused about, but these ones are, the ones you can see, are, they're absolutely stunning, um, Early and Company, um, or sorry, this is William Murray himself, um, he's located on either side of the sanctuary and the windows on the, um, the walls of the side chapels. And we've got the Ascension of Christ and the Assumption of the Virgin. And um, the, he, William Murray was the same last designer. So this is really, this is the Irish the beginning of the, um, the culture of, uh, and, and great tradition of producing very high quality stained glass in Ireland, which was, I suppose, you know, came out of um, on Tour Glenna would have been the main organisation, the main uh, group that promoted that. But William Riley was, was around before the founding of that. He was certainly active um, be before the founding of, of Antour Glenna. And while attending college, the College of Arts in the 1890s, he won the Royal Irish Academy's Taylor Scholarship jointly with William Orkham. So that's an amazing fact. William Orkham, very highly regarded uh, painter um, of. Um, in the early 20th century and so for, for William Early to be to have been a peer of his and, and, and competing and, and winning awards is, 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 is interesting to hear. He was he was afterwards then apprenticed to Edward Martin. He had a, Edward Martin had a church decorating firm on St Stephen's Green and Edward Martin is one of the people who set up and sort of with um, Sarah Purser and Ethan Home. Uh, so this is all really the, 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 the founding of, of a new, um, a whole new world for, uh, for Irish art and Irish stained glass, and um, starting with, with the likes of William Early and, and Edward Martin. Uh, the Harry Clark Studios then were part of, of this. Um, Harry Clark Studios, not actually Harry Clark. Uh, so we have St. Patrick and St. Bridget. Um, they produce, the studios produce stained glass um, after um, Harry Clark's uh, early death in, in 1930, and they, uh, they continued on for, for um, right up until the 70s. Um, and over a thousand windows uh, were made by the studio, but only 160 by the artist himself. So only 160 uh, windows were made in the life, lifetime of Harry Clark. So um, interesting to, to note that. But, the, um, and all of the figures as well, it's interesting the stained glass in this church, the, the, each window, they're very, very tall windows, it's a very big scale that the, the, the artists are working on, and they are, um, they're all one figure, more or less, with, with a small, often a little small sub-story going on underneath, just explaining what's happening in there, who the people are identifying the, 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 the saints. Um, but there are nine depictions of Our Lady, so obviously because of the dedication of the church, that's the, uh, the, the preponderance of, of uh, representations of uh, St. Mary. So here we have um, ones by Patrick Heaney, um, and this very little 
information to be, got, to be gleaned on, on Patrick Heaney, apart from the fact that he started his career in the Harry Clark Stained Glass Studios. So again, connected to, to Harry Clark. And we have on the left, um, St. Michael the Archangel, and on the right, um, St. Elizabeth and St. John the Baptist. Um, George Campbell then um, was responsible for this sort of semi-abstract uh, Rose Window. Um, I don't know if any of you have done a tour with, with Barbara Rabbit. Not sure. You have to do Barbara's tour, it's absolutely brilliant. Like she's absolutely, she really, um, I think she, what she succeeded in doing with me was getting me to look at church and really see what I could find. So in this window, you know, can you see anything? This is Barbara's question, can you see anything? <laughs> That's not abstract in the window. And the answer is the, the crown of coins. Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, it's a really stunning uh, work. Uh, George Campbell is um, just his, a little bit about his background. He was a painter and writer who grew up in Belfast, but spent much of his life in Spain. And his mother was the noted artist, Greta Bowen. Um, he um, so he, re, he he began painting in Belfast partly as a reaction to, to the wartime bombing of the city. So he was born in 1917. Um, he first showed at the Royal Browning Academy in 1948. Um, continued to show there. So again, we have another example. It's a, it's a stunning. The church has so many artworks in, in the form of stained glass from representing the, the greatness of Irish art from the 20th century. Um, but I suppose we're only really starting to appreciate as well. You know, the, um, it is the, it is the last century now. <laughs> it's not. You know, I suppose what when you have a work that that that's that that's um, separated from you by uh, you know the turn of a century, I think it almost increases its uh, significance in in, in one's mind. You know, uh, certainly. This is early studios and uh, Saint Therese of Lisieux, and then the right hand side the the uh, family, the holy family. Um, the this one here on the right hand side, Our Lady of Knock, and um, it's George Walsh, uh, and what's interesting, and Saint Darlot on the left. On the left, but I suppose what's topical at the moment about Our Lady of Knock is obviously the, the documentary which I haven't seen yet, which I'd love to see on the. Um, the whole phenomenon of the apparitions of Mark, um, and the Pope, Pope John Paul II, um, in the, the lower part of the window, um, on his visit to Ireland in 1979. So, um, also Archbishop Canaan. Canaan, that is Joseph Canaan, yeah, can be seen speaking to Pope John Paul II, um, and St. Jarlath then on the, the left hand side, the patron saint of the Archdiocese of June, born in Connacht, uh, 445. So all very uh, local and important saints locally as well. Um, just uh, great interest. And these two then, again, these are ones that I've had the privilege of being able to see because they're not covered up by the, uh, the, um, the hoarding at the moment. These are Patrick Pye, and I suppose that people would either love them or hate them. They're very, very contemporary works. Um, and Patrick Pye himself, I suppose, has, he's still alive today. Um, he's born in 1929, a sculptor, painter, and stained glass artist resident in County Dublin. Um, he was born in England of an English father and a Protestant Irish mother and was brought up um, in Ireland and converted to Catholicism then at the age of 29. Um, five years after his mother died, um, and he painted under the sculpture of Sheen Kelly. Um, he received a scholarship to study at the, at the Anne Van Eyck Academy in Holland, um, where he began working with stained glass under Albert Troost. Um, so his his work he has uh, there's actually in 2013 there was a there's been a uh, book published on his life. Um, and it, it, it mentions the fact that he's always been considered by modernists as being outmoded in his subject choice, in, in terms of his religious subject choice, and then by fans of traditional religious art as being too modernist in style. So he's quoted as saying, I didn't want to be thought of as anything but a contemporary painter. So, um, but they're, uh, to me, they're absolutely stunning works of art. The colour is absolutely beautiful, particularly in Christ the King on the left hand side. and. Um, they're just, they're, they're really beautiful. 
Um, so these, and, and they're just extremely important works of, of, of 20th century Irish art and showing the, um, the significance of the church. So part of what we're doing in, in producing a plan, a conservation plan for the church is, is the important thing is to understand its significance, to understand, uh, to get to the bottom of every aspect of the church um, that, that is important, whether it be artistic, architectural, technical, and um, social, cultural, all of these values are, are all important. Um, uh, architectural conservation poses a very new concept in Ireland. We have had architectural heritage legislation for, for the protection of architectural heritage since 2000 only, so literally only in the last 16 years. And um, St Mary's is a protected structure. So, um, and really for, for many reasons, but I suppose it's, it's easy to see why after having gone through tracing the, the development of the, of the building over time and looking at the, the artworks that it contains. And so, um, but this, this, this whole process that in conservation that has gone through, that where you look, you have a whole load of experts looking at different areas of, of, um, of the building. You look at people looking, various experts looking at the fabric, looking at different parts of the fabric of the building. Um, and you have all of these people coming together and, and really, uh, you know, pooling, pooling the, the, uh, the information and the knowledge. And it's only then that decisions can be made that are right for the building and that can ensure that its significance is retained while obviously ensuring that the building continues on into the future. Um, so the ceiling collapse of July 2015 is what sparked, I suppose, this whole process um, and uh, one of the, um, of the reasons why the hoarding is up, as you're probably all aware, is to ensure the safety of the occupants during the, um, while this process of investigation is going on and understanding of the building is, is continuing. Um, this gives you an idea of the condition of the side aisle roofs um, which led to the, the partial collapse of the ceilings. Um, great area of view showing the bubbling up of the asphalt on the, the left hand side, the mm -hmm. flat roofs. So this is where the, um, the issues are, are, are stemming from. It's another amazing image of, mm -hmm. of the asphalt. Just for um, really interest, the, the, the roof is in really good condition in general. Um, and this is a, is a view of the, the steel trusses um, and the, the barrel vault uh, underneath the, uh, the rafters there. Um, and that's the new, the new section of the church, um, a suspended ceiling, a very different method of construction, but also in very good condition. Um, the slates are all in very good condition. There's very few that have uh, or slipped or broken. Uh, so one of the things, sorry about this being on the side, this is one of the, the, the transept uh, stained glass windows and it's an example of an area, a part that we were looking at. There's a few issues that, that have to be looked at. This is one of them. Um, the storm glazing. Storm glazing is there. It, it's controversial really how you approach protection of um, windows from, from weather and from vandalism. And there are the, the Heritage Council has published a book on care and conservation of, of stained glass windows, which, which I suppose puts forward a few um, ways of, of, of protecting them. And still, ideas are are, 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 are being looked at for, for how how best to to protect protect windows. And you have um, obviously the, the issue with this is that you fall pieces falling down. There's a bit that's fallen down. So really, it's, it's looking at ensuring that, that whatever goes up is, is, is uh, sturdy. Mind you, we are living in the West Ireland. And, uh, mm -hmm. We have phenomenal winds here. And, um, but having said that, whatever goes up in its place will have to work well for the window in terms of the, uh, the conditions that, that, that are set up between the glazing and, and the actual stained glass itself um, to ensure that, that you, you, know, you don't actually end up causing further damage to, or damage to, the, to the glass to the, the lead work through condensation or um, or overheating, any of those issues. So it's something that has to be carefully considered. The third issue with the church is the the apse walls, um, and again with 
conservation everything I suppose is looked at carefully to see where the source of the problem is this is caused by uh, moisture movement in the fabric which is uh, carrying building salts to the surface which crystallize and then form this efflorescence and really it's a case of, of, of understanding how all of the different elements of the building are interacting with each other um, and understanding the, the source of the problem and then um, fixing it, managing it. The, uh, some other image there of, of what we're still trying to, we have a, a, an expert stone uh, person who's analysing the material to understand its exact co uh, constituents, so is it marble, is it steliola, and it's really important before anything is done, before a decision is made to do anything with any element of the building, that it's, that it's fully understood um, to ensure that no further damage will be done through, uh, through repair. So whatever repairs are proposed have to be really carefully considered. And that's the end of my slides, and we're just up to 25 past eight, so I think